Hello and welcome to Classical Mechanics 2. In this video, we'll be talking about Hamiltonian dynamics in phase space. Let's consider a Hamiltonian H, which is a function of generalized positions Q and generalized momenta P. These are vectors, where Q ranges from Q1 to Qn. This could be a system with n generalized positions or a system with one generalized coordinate in n dimensions and the corresponding generalized momenta range from P1 through Pn. The space defined by all the generalized positions and all the generalized momenta is called phase space. Hamilton's equations evolve all of these positions and momenta forward in time, which means we need two n coupled first order equations to fully determine the dynamics of a system described by the Hamiltonian H. Hamilton's equations are the rate of change of qi is equal to dh by dpi, and this is some function we're going to call fi of the vectors q and p. We have an equivalent equation, the rate of change of the generalized momenta pi is equal to minus the derivative of h with respect to qi. This is equal to some function g of i, which again is a function of the vectors q and p. This description of the dynamics is in contrast with both the Lagrangian and Newtonian methods, which give us n coupled second order equations for each system, and these aren't always easy to solve. But let's see what we can do with Hamilton's equations. We can write each of these as vector equations, where the rate of change of the generalized vector q is given by some vector function f, which is itself a function of the q's and the p's. And likewise, the generalized momenta evolve according to some vector function g, which is again a function of q's and p's. In phase space, there is no reason to treat these coordinates differently from one another. So we can combine them into a single vector, let's call it z, and we're going to get this by stringing together all of the generalized positions and all of the generalized momenta together into one large vector. This vector z is a point in the phase space of our system. Each point in phase space corresponds to a unique set of initial conditions. That is, each point, z, tells us where each particle is located and what their momenta are at any given point in time. The entire dynamics of the system are obtained by evolving this point forward in phase space according to Hamilton's equations. So in phase space, the rate of change of z is given by some vector function h, which is a function of the q's and the p's, which is obtained by stringing together all of the fi's and all of the gi's, and this gives us the full dynamics of the trajectory in phase space. This type of dynamics is something we've had a lot of experience solving. Going back to video 6, we studied a bunch of dynamical systems models, including the predator-prey model. Here's an example of the dynamics we saw. The x-axis is the prey population, and the y-axis is the predator population. The blue arrows represent a vector field that describes the dynamics of the system. The x component of the vector field describes the rate of change of the prey population, and the y component of the vector field is the rate of change of the predator population. We analyzed this using the slope field method. Every point in this space represents an initial condition, the number of predators and the number of prey at a given instant in time. Then integrating along this vector field, we get the total dynamics of the system. The exact same thing happens when we look at Hamiltonian dynamics in phase space. Here's a plot of phase space, where q is on the x-axis and p is on the y-axis. This can be analyzed exactly the same way we did with the dynamical systems model. We treat the vector field as a velocity in phase space, where the components of the velocity are given by Hamilton's equations. z dot is equal to dh by dp and minus dh by dq. Any point is an initial condition, and the streamlines, which are the trajectory of my system, just flow along tangent to the blue vector field. In the rest of the video, we'll explore the consequences of this type of dynamics on phase space. The trajectories we just solved for, the solution to Hamilton's equations, are called orbits in phase space. Starting at a particular set of initial conditions given by a point in phase space, we integrate along the vector field and we get a phase space orbit. One of the most important points 
will make today is that starting with some set of initial conditions Z0, the resulting trajectory in phase space is unique. This is a theorem. I'm not going to prove it right now, but we'll need it going forward in order to prove some other results. A consequence of this is that no two trajectories can cross. We'll prove this by contradiction. Imagine that we have two trajectories that do cross at some point z prime. Then if z prime were an initial condition, it would have two or more trajectories starting from that point, and this violates uniqueness. This implies that phase space orbits can never cross at any point in time. Imagine we have some point z0 in phase space, and we're going to evolve our dynamics forward in time to z0 of t. Let's take a neighborhood of points around z0, and we'll call it a. And we're going to flow all of the points in a along in time too. That gives us a neighborhood around z0 of t, and we'll call it a of t. We'd like to show that any point that starts in a ends up in the area a of t at a later time. For example, this point here starts in A and ends up in A of T. This tells us that neighborhoods in phase space remain connected for all time. That means that instead of looking at individual trajectories, we can simply look at the entire trajectory of A to get the full dynamics of our system. In order to prove that, let's assume that some point B that starts in A doesn't end up in A of T at a later point. Here are regions A and A of T and the trajectory of some point Z0. Imagine we have some point B that at time T ends up outside the region A of T. Then the trajectory of B must cross the trajectory of at least one point in A. And this violates uniqueness. Most of what we've looked at so far has been 2D, but this applies to higher dimensions as well. Let's consider a higher dimensional system. A of t is some region in phase space that is bounded by the path gamma. We'd like to know what happens as we flow this forward in time. We're going to move it according to z dot by some amount delta t. This is going to give us a new region at a of t plus delta t that's bounded by the curve gamma of t plus delta t. What happens to the region A as it flows along according to z dot? In particular, does the volume of A change as we evolve it forward in time? To explore this, let's zoom into a little section of the boundary gamma. This vector n is perpendicular to both the curve gamma and to its parent surface A. We'll look at some infinitesimal piece along this curve delta gamma and evolve it forward in time according to v times delta t. To calculate the change in area as we change gamma, let's look at the volume of this infinitesimal area element. The volume of this area element dA is equal to the surface normal dotted into the vector v times delta t which is the projection of the flow direction into the surface normal. That's the bit of the flow that's perpendicular to delta gamma. Then we multiply it by delta gamma to get the total area of this little patch. Now if we want to look at the change in area of the whole patch, we need to integrate this over the entire path gamma. So the change in area is the integral along gamma of the surface normal dotted into the velocity field times delta t. We can calculate this line integral using the divergence theorem. The divergence theorem states that if we have a surface A with a normal vector n, then the integral around the boundary of the surface gamma of the normal dotted into some vector field v is equal to the integral over the surface of the divergence of v, where the divergence is equal to dv by dx plus dv by dy plus dv by dz. So in the limit that delta t goes to zero, the rate of change of the area in our region is given by the integral around gamma of n hat dotted into v d gamma, which according to the divergence theorem is equal to the integral across the surface A of the divergence of the dynamics z hat. And we'll find out in a minute that the divergence of z dot is equal to zero, so the area doesn't change. The statement we just made is actually a theorem by Liouville. The volume of any closed surface in phase space remains constant as that surface moves throughout phase space. It turns out this is a consequence of trajectories never crossing. 
The divergence of the velocity field, which is given by Hamilton's equations, z dot is equal to zero. We can show this explicitly by taking the divergence of Hamilton's equations, which are z dot equals dh by dp and minus dh by dq. When we take the divergence of this, we end up with d by dq of dh by dp plus d by dp of minus dh by dq. And these two terms cancel out and we end up with the divergence of z dot equals zero. This has a lot of consequences for constructing mechanics for Hamiltonian systems. For instance, having zero divergence means trajectories in the system can't be created or removed out of thin air. This also means that for high dimensional systems where we can't visualize the phase space, we're able to keep track of different types of behavior in the system just by looking at a handful of candidate trajectories. We don't have to worry about missing things because the trajectories around those trajectories behave in the same way. In the next video, we'll take what we've learned about Hamiltonian and Lagrangian mechanics and apply it to a familiar system, the two-body central force system, and see if we can learn anything new about its mechanics. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.